session. I am very happy to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Nathalie Defra, from, from the University of Rouen. She's also a member of the UCL Archives at the Corner of Arts Superior de Paris. And she's an expert on Husser. And about uh, her research topic, I would like to mention, especially today, cardiophenomenology, because is uh, a way for redefining neurophenomenological approach to cognition developed by Francisco Varela, having part of the center. And she combined this also with the use of approach. She, she will tell us. As uh, she published a lot, both in French and in English, let me just remember her first book that came from her PhD, so Transcendence in, uh, Transcendence in Carnation with the Subjectivité Commentivité and another book is Attention et Vigilance, La Croisée de la Phenomenologie de Sciences Cognitives. And just let me mention a paper that uh, I like it a lot, The Rainbow of Emotions that has been published in 2008. So thank you very much for being here. And yes, Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Laura. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Pierre, as well. Uh, to um, um, have invited me to contribute to your uh, uh, research work, seminar, and uh, conferences about emotions. So um, as you uh, saw uh, on, the, on the slide, uh, my topic will be surprise. Uh, and I, I try to, uh, to go in the direction of uh, uh, questioning or uh, trying to find out in, to what extent uh, surprise can be uh, named a cognitive emotion. Uh, and I will also uh, give you a few hints about uh, the underlying uh, um, approach, uh, cardiophenomenology, which is actually uh, the method through which uh, I we, we went into this uh, issue of surprise. So there is a correlation between the method and, and the theme on, on, this, uh, on this level. Um, so that's uh, part of an INR uh, project that is now uh, over, but that we are still uh, uh, thrilled to, to carry on, uh, as many uh, INR research projects, uh, which, uh, which was on this uh, topic of uh, surprise. Um, and uh, just a few uh, thanks for the people who uh, uh, are still working uh, with me on this, uh, um, on this issue or uh, worked with me uh, uh, a few years ago already. On this, uh, on this topic. Uh, so in this uh, talk, I will go into uh, uh, four different uh, steps. Uh, the first, uh, surprise and emotion. So the, well, the difficulty or the complexity of the relationships between surprise and emotion. Uh, what I uh, call the dynamic of surprise. So we will be in a familiar uh, framework uh, with the uh, the, uh, what we heard uh, this morning. Um, a third step, entering into surprise via uh, uh, valence. So we already uh, 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 heard about uh, valence this morning. And finally, uh, probably short, sh more shortly, uh, because of the time probably, <laughs> uh, how a cardiophenomenology may, uh, may be, as a hypothesis, uh, uh, interesting uh, epistemology for understanding surprise. Uh, so some uh, references uh, just to uh, to give the uh, the underground of what I'm going to uh, uh, to uh, develop. Uh, so so two articles um, uh, mainly, and uh, also a book that just uh, uh, was just published. So I'm I'm happy to give you the uh, and that's uh, for for you, Pierre. That's <laughs> um, so uh, so the first first step: uh, surprise and emotion. So I will go, to, it's a, a bit didactic in the way I will proceed, uh, just to give a kind of general framework uh, in this first step. Uh, we'll go uh, into these different uh, uh, sub-steps so, uh, that here are on the, on the, on the slide, um, going through uh, some very familiar accounts uh, I can imagine for you in, in philosophy, uh, in classical philosophy, also in modern uh, psychology. Uh, which tend to uh, put surprise on the, on the side of emotion and uh, other uh, uh, accounts that um, 
uh, blur, blur a bit this uh, uh, landscape uh, uh, where uh, we have the, the equivalence between surprise and emotion. So uh, it, it, it won't give us a, very, a real solution, <laughs> actually, when, when we go through these different steps, but it's just a way to show the complexity of the issue. And so I will, uh, I will end up, so I give you the results before <laughs> I go into the different steps. Uh, uh, I will try to show how surprise uh, involves some emotional components, but results a more encompassing circular phenomenon. So that's the point where I will go as a result of these first steps, step. Um, so some uh, quotations just to illustrate uh, the, first, uh, the first point, uh, very well-known quotations, so I, will, I won't read them uh, uh, extensively. Uh, Descartes in Patients of Soul, where uh, surprise is indirectly approached through admiration uh, as a first primary patient without any opposite. And Kant, for example, quite exemplarily, uh, where uh, a surprise uh, is understood as a, a sudden uh, sensory, a sensorial uh, uh, affect, as opposed to patient, which is uh, a, durative, uh, uh, a durative effect. Um, um, for psychologists, um, and mainly um, for Ekman uh, in uh, the first place, but also for uh, Plutik later on, um, surprise is uh, understood as a basic uh, emotion, primary or basic emotions, emotion among uh, others, um, as is uh, shown here. Um, so Plutchik uh, developed uh, this uh, very uh, complex account of uh, the will of emotions, and I will only uh, uh, and, uh, point out uh, the connection, the inner connection he. Uh, uh, he, um, he uh, uh, stress, stresses uh, between surprise and anticipation uh, in this very systemic and dynamic model uh, of, uh, of emotions, because I will come back to it later on. Um, in phenomenology now, uh, surprise is uh, remarkably absent uh, in some uh, very important uh, founding phenomenologies of emotions, so in Scheler, in Heidegger, in Sartre, uh, in a, more, in a, in a, in a provo provo provocative way, I, I call them phenomenologies with no surprise, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because they don't uh, uh, directly uh, deal with this issue and uh, use other words in order to uh, um, uh, indirectly uh, uh, point out this, uh, uh, this issue. Uh, so, uh, with very uh, high-level um, uh, moral intersubjective emotions uh, in, in Schiller, uh, with uh, uh, a very strong ontological uh, um, understanding uh, of affection in Heidegger, and, uh, and with um, in Sartre in a, very, in a way that would need, I say, a, a closer investigations, and um, because it's um, more heterogeneous in, in, in the way he uh, it goes into this issue, uh, but maybe the, more, the more, most interesting thing in, in Sartre for going into surprise would be what he called the magical uh, conduct, I think, in his uh, emotion uh, text, we, um, uh, although he doesn't uh, go directly into surprise. Um, so it's a bit uh, uh, disappointing, in a sense, uh, when we go into these uh, very, uh, uh, um, uh, very uh, massive uh, uh, phenomenologies to discover that they actually uh, didn't... Uh, um, uh, talk about this uh, question. Um, in Husserl as well, actually surprise is very, very, uh, um, very, um, um, uh, very, um, how do you say, very, uh, not very much uh, <laughs> um, dealt with. Uh, but we can re also reconstruct or reconstitute uh, different uh, levels where in the uh, per per perceptive uh, experience or in the affective experience or in the uh, more uh, high-level gnosiological experience, we have uh, <laughs> possibilities to go into surprise. So I will, I will also come back to it uh, later on. Um, uh, but it's not uh, uh, um, a direct theme uh, in Husserl uh, either. Um, so the... the um, uh, 
the result is that uh, in these phenomenologies, uh, surprise is uh, um, um, mainly absorbed into uh, uh, either gno gnoseological or ontological aff effects. Um, so I, I gave a few uh, situation, uh, typical situations where we, we could find out surprise without surprise being already named. Uh, I'm affected by the noise of a uh, sirene where, which triggers my no noticing it or I'm waiting a friend uh, in five minutes doesn't come up so it generates disappointment. Uh, or I have an inner tension, bodily inner tension, which is released at some specific moments. Uh, so, uh, and it uh, gives way to uh, uh, laughing, for example. So uh, these uh, different uh, scenari scenarios, scenarios um, appeal to actually surprise, but uh, don't, uh, do not uh, thematize it. Uh, but out of these scenarios, we can uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> gain the, the idea a surprise is a kind of uh, breaking emergence, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, uh, it's, it happens or it, uh, it arises within uh, a phenomenal process which is uh, 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 bodily and cognitive, both uh, twofold, actually, um, phenomenal process. Um, <coughs> to carry on, um, just to mention a few uh, recent, uh, recent uh, approaches or steps in phenomenology. Um, Eric Marion on the one side, Henri Maldinet on the other side, two French uh, um, contemporary philosophers, um, uh, are, have the specificity to uh, thematize surprise, which was not the case for uh, uh, the others. Uh, so it's, uh, of course, interesting. Uh, but what's um, uh, maybe s uh, still more interesting is that they both actually, without uh, referring to each other, uh, they both uh, uh, conclude that surprise uh, is a, a strongly uh, passive experience. Um, so you have the, the quotations in, uh, in French here. And uh, it's also uh, very close actually to um, uh, some very uh, rare uh, Husserl, uh, Husserl's Husserlian occurrences of surprise. Uh, in very early texts, actually, where uh, Husserl also describes surprise as a passive, uh, a subjective experience, um, um, which is very, actually very close to uh, what Descartes was uh, uh, called the, the passion. Um, so something that you really uh, uh, undergo without any possibility to recover from it. So it's a very radical uh, uh, experience. Um, but in a sense, you, you could say that uh, it's, uh, it doesn't belong to phenomenology in a, in, a, in a regular way because you don't have any possibility to uh, uh, reinstall something like a, a, a concordant uh, process of the experience. So you, you, you're not able to identify uh, or to uh, move on from this uh, uh, hyper passive experience. Uh, in this uh, very uh, disturbing framework in phenomenology, or very um, uh, not very coherent framework in phenomenology, we have an, an exception, which is uh, Paul Ricoeur's uh, Le Volontaire et l'Involontaire, a very early text, um, where we have a very uh, a nice account of surprise, which is uh, presented as uh, the simple source of all emotions, so in a certain uh, very... Um, maybe inspiring a Cartesian way, uh, in admiration being in Descartes as well, understood at the source of any, every uh, patient. So it's a kind of a transposition in Ricoeur, surprise as, as the source of all emotions. And, um, and when he develops uh, this uh, assertion, then we find out that for him surprise is a circular phenomenon, so a kind of a process, um, activating and reactivating the bodily and the cognitive uh, components. So uh, uh, the interplay and the, uh, uh, and the, the interaction and recursive interaction between, uh, between body and, and, uh, and mind. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's very, it was a very uh, nice discovery, <laughs> I, I must say, when uh, I read this text, because I, I uh, finally found out uh, what I was looking for. <laughs> Uh, or what I had uh, hypothesized uh, in the first place without uh, uh, having this uh, 
a textual reference. So it was um, a nice confirmation of, uh, of what uh, we were looking for. Um, so, um, so the question that uh, arises uh, when we uh, go into these different uh, um, historical and phenomenological uh, difficulties uh, regarding surprise is uh, to ask if surprise, uh, um, if, if surprise does not belong mainly to emotional uh, affective acts, is it a cognitive act? Well, as, we, as we saw, uh, we have a, it seems to be that we have a strong interaction between the bodily and the cognitive uh, dimensions. Uh, in a dynam dynamical way uh, regarding surprise, but emotion, which was uh, the starting point in uh, Descartes, Kant, and uh, uh, psychology, seems not to be actually uh, the, the leading uh, hypothesis. So if we uh, now go into this uh, hypothesis, more cognitive hypothesis, we found out another tradition, another uh, philosophical and uh, theoretical tradition uh, and we find out, namely, uh, in uh, Aristoteles' uh, poetics, um, an understanding of surprise uh, as uh, what uh, Aristoteles names eplectikon, which comes from, which is uh, linked to the root plege in, in Greek, and uh, which uh, uh, is the, the, the name of the stroke. Um, so, it's uh, surprise is uh, understood as a shock, and um, it, it, it generates uh, emotions, and it uh, also generates uh, attention, uh, but it's understood by Aristoteles as a process um, uh, in the framework of the uh, tragedy, actually. Um, but it's not understood as something that's uh, isolated. It's understood as a, as a process uh, bringing about uh, both uh, emotion, emotional uh, components and attentional components. Um, so it's, uh, it's interesting to have this in mind. Um, in order to explore uh, other um, um, threads in, this, uh, in the tradition, in uh, the historical tradition of philosophy, so I will go very quick, uh, I will be very quick in uh, uh, just mentioning some uh, authors uh, belonging to an, uh, uh, an empirical uh, tradition, um, Adam Smith, Charles Sanders Peace, and more recently, David Sand, Dennett, and Ortoni, who is a, a linguist, uh, actually, a cognitive linguist, um, and who uh, actually uh, all understand surprise as a cognitive emotion. Uh, in in uh, what sense? Uh, for them, uh, with surprise, knowledge or epistemic uh, prediction are put in the wrong, and so being surprised amounts to becoming aware of the discrepancy between what I thought or believed and what is actually. So it reveals a non-coincidence, a rupture, a, a breach uh, between two states of knowledge and the, indicates the, the pragmatic necessity of adjusting or, or coping with uh, this, uh, uh, this um, um, non-coincidence. Uh, so if we go very uh, early in, uh, um, in the um, 19th century, Adam Smith, we already have this kind of understanding so we can can find it already. And in Pierce, the 19th century as well. So, um, of course, Davidson and Dennett are more prominent uh, in their uh, recent uh, um, understanding of the phenomenon. But uh, we have a, uh, a long lasting tradition that would be interesting to, uh, well, to bring uh, with us in order to understand uh, uh, otherwise, actually, the, this uh, process of surprise. And what's still more interesting is that we can reread. Descartes, Husserl, and Plutchik, for example, with this, uh, uh, with this understanding. Uh, so uh, philosophers or uh, linguists uh, or cognitive psychologists who are more uh, named rationalists are actually very interesting to be, uh, uh, to be um, uh, read again uh, with this uh, understanding. For example, uh, if, we t if, you, if you take again the quotation I, I gave uh, uh, from uh, Descartes' patient, Patients of, of the Soul, um, you can reconstitute the Cartesian a cognitive dynamic of surprise. An object is encountered, which is judged new in reference to our previous knowledge. It triggers admiration, which is defined as a sudden surprise of the soul, 
the effect of which is a becoming attentive to this object. So you have at different moments in the process different markers of different kinds which are all cognitive. The judgment, a previous knowledge, and a becoming attentive. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to reread Descartes in this, uh, in this way. Same for Husserl. If you look at the Husserlian dynamic of surprise, you have, uh, given the quotations I, I mentioned earlier, you have an, a perception and a, which is affected, but the affection is, a, is actually cognitive. It's not emotional. Uh, um, it's just the fact that I'm, for example, affected by a sound, so it has nothing emotional. So the affected bodily awaiting perception, so I'm awaiting in a very open way, of an object that is uh, alluring me, a sensory object that is alluring me, and it triggers my noticing it. So again, attention. It creates surprise as an effect of rupture in the process of identification, which is a, a cognitive uh, process. Um, and then the content of the, of the rupture may be disappointment or satisfaction, so you see that emotion uh, arises here as an effect that is associated to the rupture, but it's not uh, the content, the specific content of the rupture. Um, so, well, it's, an, it's not the same kind of dynamic, but you can find out similarities between both. It would be interesting to compare both dynamics more closely, of course, because they, well, they're not completely fitting, uh, mapping each other. Uh, but still, I mean, there are some uh, uh, global uh, uh, dynamics uh, that are similar. And in, in the end, in a very uh, uh, maybe um, not so complex way, but uh, if you look at uh, Plutchik's uh, understanding of surprise, as I mentioned, it is dynamically uh, uh, linked to an, an anticipation component. Mm -hmm. So you already you also have a kind of uh, temporal uh, horizon, which is mentioned in Husserl with the awaiting, and uh, and this temporal horizon is uh, mainly cognitive here as well. Um, so, as a first step, we have, uh, uh, well, it's a bit, a lot of material <laughs> uh, to, uh, to go into, but I try to, uh, to, to um, well, to, um, uh, to structure them for you in order you to see, uh, well, that in this first step, actually, we start from uh, a first, uh, um, uh, first assertion, uh, linking or identifying a surprise, surprise to emotion, and we end up with something that is quite the opposite, in a sense. Um, so, uh, so then, on the basis of this account, uh, as a second uh, step, uh, the, uh, the, the hypothesis we made was to, um, to go into this idea of a dynamic of surprise, so surprise not being reducible to uh, an instant, to a shock, to something abstract, but uh, being uh, in, uh, including a process, uh, including different, uh, different phases. And also, uh, first of all, here, including an emotional, an emotional components, but uh, resulting more encompassing uh, phenomenon, irreducible to emotion, and uh, the different uh, uh, components uh, of surprise then include uh, time as, a, as the very um, uh, sense of the dynamic, uh, and first of all, as a, in this anticipation awaiting a dimension, but also attention. We saw uh, that attention occurs uh, either before or after the shock, uh, given uh, 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 in, the, in the different uh, uh, quotations I, 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 I mentioned. Also, a um, uh, bodily component, of course, a cognitive, a directly cognitive component, but also language, uh, which, can, which can take different forms. It can be a reactional language, a body language, rationalizations after, after aftermath, uh, narrations. So language can be uh, also of very different forms uh, in surprise. I, I won't go into it, uh, uh, into this dimension uh, today, but it's, uh, we are working with linguists as well in, our, in this research project, so, uh, uh, so there, are, there is a lot to say um, about uh, language here. 
So the question is, what's the place or what's the room for affect or emotion? I take, I, I put these uh, two words together. Uh, if we have this uh, whole uh, structure and this um, uh, multi-faceted uh, uh, dynamic of surprise. Um, so in order to go to, uh, to try to answer this question, I need to uh, uh, just to present you very briefly the experimental uh, protocol uh, we, um, uh, we built with um, uh, scientists, with uh, neurophysiologists, which is a startle emotional uh, uh, protocol. Startle being the physiological name for surprise, the bodily uh, exemplary phenomenon uh, for surprise. And, um, and so we, we were looking for uh, this dynamic, actually, in this protocol. And, um, and so we built a protocol made of three uh, micro uh, phases, uh, which are anticipation, crisis, and contre-coup, aftermath. Uh, the crisis being the name of, uh, um, of uh, the, the image or the sound which is uh, presented to uh, the subject that were, uh, um, that were uh, interviewed and uh, the physiological rhythm uh, of them, of which, uh, whose physiological rhythm were, were also, also uh, registered. At the, at the same time. So we, we had uh, physiological data and also uh, uh, lived, uh, lived experienced data. So we have the crisis, the moment of the emergence of the sound or the image, and we have uh, um, an anticipative phase, uh, phase of six uh, seconds and an aftermath phase of uh, 40 seconds. So we try to, um, well, to structure actually this uh, the possible dynamic of surprise through this uh, uh, protocol, which gives a, a way to some results. So I, I, I skip the whole process of uh, uh, the data, the analysis, and so, so forth. And uh, it gives some uh, results as a, as a scheme here, uh, which bring about uh, different components. So of course, the, the uh, sequential uh, dynamic, the time sequential dynamic, um, uh, which is, um, as you see, um, uh, both um, emotional but also uh, perceptive. So what, what appeared uh, at most was uh, different uh, qualities of emotion, but also uh, uh, emotions which are, which are intertwined with uh, uh, perceptive and uh, cognitive aspects. So it was quite difficult actually to sort out what was emotional, what was percep perceptual, what was cognitive. Um, we tried to analyze and to uh, uh, show differences or different aspects, but actually it's, it remains uh, a bit difficult. Uh, for example, to uh, uh, in the aftermath, uh, when you look at the, uh, the negative uh, emotion, um, what's emotional in ruminations and, and ill at ease uh, state? <clears throat> what's uh, cognitive? I mean, there is a kind of mixed dimension that is difficult to uh, disarticulate. Uh, just to, to, to give this example, or when you look at uh, anticipation and the uh, positive uh, dimension of emotion, the tension looking forward, when you look at looking forward, uh, it's a kind of tension, with inner tension, which is both emotional and cognitive. It's difficult, the, the, the theme tension, the term tension, uh, includes both emotion and cognition. So it's, it's, it's as if actually this uh, distinction uh, was not operational uh, to describe what's going on. Oh, you need both, but it's not satisfactory in a sense. Uh, so I... I, I, I came to this uh, uh, small uh, model, uh, finally, so with two main s structures, which, are, uh, which I uh, named the condition of, uh, uh, of the moment of the, of, the, of the shock and the involvement or the implication. And um, what appeared to me is that uh, we have two, two main structures of surprise, which, which are attention and emotion. And these uh, two main uh, dimensions are uh, 
our, uh, in a reverse or a chiasmatic uh, uh, situation, one, uh, um, one to the other. Uh, in the, in the um, um, condition uh, dimension, attention is uh, the major dimension in the, in the sense of the anticipation or the awaiting. So that's the ma major uh, dimension. And emotion is also here as a kind of minor dimension, which is visible in tension, and maybe more important if tension becomes anxiety, of course. So it's, uh, it has to be modulated depending of the, on, the, on the kind of surprise, of course. Um, and in the, in the implication or aftermath phase, uh, we have a, a, a minor, more minor role of attention in the kind, in the, which can be named uh, relief, uh, relâchement, release, or, uh, or maybe also major if it's a hypervigilance. So it can be modulated. It depends uh, again on the on the kind of surprise, and uh, and what's major is uh, more emotional. Uh, because uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the aftermath, the affective aftermath of the shock. So we have a kind of uh, um, uh, modulation between uh, major and minor uh, dimensions regarding attention and emotion, depending on the kind of surprise. As far as the, the crisis itself, which I named a non-experience, uh, it's either attentional or emotional. There is no attention, no emotion at that moment, at that very moment of the, of the shock, uh, precisely because uh, it's a non-experience. It's a moment that you don't live. You live it aftermath. I mean, you, I was surprised. Surprise is an effect in our very common sense uh, language. So you, you understand just afterwards that you have been surprised. <laughs> but at the very moment, you have no experience, no lived, actually, a dimension which is available. So, in a sense, no uh, uh, attention and no uh, emotion. So that's what we end, end up uh, with. So to, just to, uh, 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 to, uh, uh, to put things together, uh, we, uh, we uh, finally uh, came with this uh, temporal dynamics of surprise with uh, um, three different phases, uh, an anticipation phase and aftermath phase, which are both attentional and emotional, and a crisis phase, which is a, um, a blank of emotion and a kind of, a kind of floating of attention. So I don't know where I am with the time. Then, so I will go. I will go uh, maybe a bit uh, uh, quicker because um, um, actually, it's uh, what I wanted to say is, uh, is already said now. I think. So uh, I had two other steps, uh, which include uh, the question of understanding as maybe a possibility or a hypothesis or a, a solution, given the difficulty of this uh, int intricacy between uh, cognition and emotion in order to understand surprise. Well. I, uh, actually, I, I gave a first a possibility to, uh, uh, to go out the difficulty if you understand uh, the dynamic of surprise as, as a both attentional and emotional. Then you have a, po a solution, a possible solution in order to understand the dynamic. Another so, uh, idea would be to, uh, uh, to introduce uh, this notion of valence, 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 I think. Um, uh, in order to, um, to avoid, to, um, uh, to stick surprise to uh, something positive or negative. Uh, of course, we know that uh, there are positive and negative surprises. But Pierre already uh, said that uh, it's, uh, of course, it's uh, well known, but it's not maybe describing the structure, the, 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 the structure of surprise itself. So valence is, a, is a, maybe an interesting way to uh, describe uh, the polarity itself um, uh, in, independently from the uh, positive or negative uh, content. So I will, I will add this uh, uh, possibility to uh, maybe to complexify the, the, this uh, process of surprise, um, but I, I, won't, I won't develop it right now. 
So I had a few uh, slides about uh, this notion of valence, but probably you know that already, so I won't, uh, I won't go into it now. Um, well, I already said that, so it's okay. Um, well, so the, the idea would be to understand uh, through valence this twofold mode of uh, cognitive emotion or appearing in the dynamics of surprise. And finally, uh, very shortly, uh, so as a last uh, step, um, um, what's underlying this whole uh, research uh, um, project, look, uh, uh, this, uh, with this word cardiophenomenology, which is uh, probably intriguing for you, um, uh, and uh, which um, um, relies on this uh, difficulty about surprise, uh, we, we already uh, uh, understood now, uh, so the, this uh, equivalence and uh, problematic equivalence in uh, psychology between surprise and emotion, and this uh, difficulty to uh, uh, find a way to access to surprise in uh, phenomenology or the necessity to reconstruct it through other words or cat categories. Um, so uh, in order to find out a way uh, to... Uh, uh, to uh, well, to, to have a, a satisfying uh, methodology. Um, the idea was to, through, uh, with cardiophenomenology, uh, to, uh, um, uh, to use uh, um, two levels of um, understanding. The one situated on the physiological, uh, on the physiological uh, level the other one on the uh, experiential, uh, subjective, lived uh, level, um, and to find out a way to show how these two levels has to have to be articulated together in order to describe, uh, to say uh, things quite uh, 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 quickly, in order to understand what's going on when you startle uh, physiologically and at the same time uh, in your uh, lived inner experience. So the idea was to find out a way to describe both uh, uh, dim dimensions and to show how they were uh, articulated. Uh, so why cardiophenomenology? Um, it's a, a direct link with uh, uh, Varela's uh, uh, approach of neurophenomenology. And so the methodology is uh, the, the same. Uh, the idea is to uh, bring together uh, uh, two, uh, co two levels, two uh, constraints, two uh, levels of, of uh, understanding, uh, first-person level and third-person level, so uh, lived experience and uh, um, uh, physiological uh, data, and to show how they uh, have to... Uh, not only articulate uh, to each other, but to generate each other. So to bring about something more complex mm -hmm. through the articulation of both levels. So it's far more than a correlation uh, because it, it's, it's a producing uh, methodology. Um, but the difficulty with neurophenomenology um, is that uh, it's a very, uh, I think it's a very um, a strong uh, heuristic uh, hypothesis, um, but it's, it remains uh, difficult to uh, uh, operate practically um, because in Varela's framework, we have on the one side Husserl's categories, which are uh, uh, generic categories of experience, uh, and you know, on the other side, uh, neuro, neuro, neurodynamic uh, data. So, uh, so we have actually uh, two levels. Uh, we can't interact because they are ontologically dissociated. Uh, neuro, uh, neurological data cannot be accessed to by the subject. And, and, um, and Husserl's categories are also uh, inaccessible uh, I mean, there are structural categories, so um, no subject can really, I mean, you can refer to them as, uh, as categories, but not as uh, first-person accounts. So it's, it's, there is a difficulty of uh, methodology when you try to, um, to, put, to put the methodology, methodology into, into play. Uh, so with cardiophenomenology, the idea was to, uh, uh, to bring these two levels together or to uh, bring them closer 
uh, into um, an experiential uh, unity of uh, my uh, being, of my subject being. Uh, physiological, organic on the one side, and uh, first person subjective on the other side. So to find out a kind of what, what I call a, a, a fold, the fold of, uh, of the organic subjective fold, which means that like a fold, uh, there is a unity. So you have two aspects, two, uh, but they're uh, inherently linked. So you, you don't have a duality which you, you want on the, uh, to correlate because you, at the beginning you have the unity and, and you, uh, uh, you can uh, work on the articulation which is uh, first and, and, and foremost given at the beginning. So said in, uh, to say it in a very uh, more uh, common sense way, uh, the idea was to, re to, uh, to, to uh, use um, um, in the physiological, on the f physiological level to use the uh, cardiac uh, rhythm, which is something you can pre-consciously uh, ex experience, even if it's not uh, explicitly or reflectively uh, given to you uh, as a subject, you can, uh, you can feel it in a very uh, diffuse or tacit way, but you can also uh, well, you can, uh, you can just uh, uh, um, have an access, a direct access to it. Uh, whereas it's difficult to uh, feel your uh, neurons. So you have an, a pre-conscious access to uh, your uh, cardiac rhythm or to a peripheric sensation as well, uh, which are uh, uh, other physiological markers. Um, and so it, it, uh, it provides us with this uh, continuity, experiential continuity, which is both uh, uh, organic and lived, which has this twofold uh, dimension. And so the idea, in order to, also to, to, to refer to what uh, Laura uh, uh, said at the beginning of our talk uh, about, uh, about the different uh, theories uh, and uh, and the, uh, the inactive, e e embedded, and uh, extended uh, cognition and embodied cognition. Uh, the idea was to, uh, to uh, make a, a room for the heart in this uh, uh, framework. So uh, to, uh, uh, well, to include, in fact, this, uh, uh, this uh, dimension um, uh, among uh, um, um, uh, the, the, the mind, the context, uh, the environment, the world, uh, and the body, uh, and to, uh, uh, to put uh, the heart also in the play, in play, not to exclude it. Not to put it as something uh, completely else, because of course the heart is also in the body, uh, but it's not in the brain. <laughs> so it has to be uh, specified uh, as, a, uh, as a system and uh, to be shown as a complementary system that maybe uh, uh, is able to, uh, uh, to show us something uh, specific about uh, our effective uh, emotional uh, function. Um, so, um, I will go a bit, uh, a bit quicker here, uh, just to um, give a few uh, uh, quotations about uh, Dennett again. Uh, also, this uh, uh, bodily physiological dimension of surprise, and also this uh, uh, pre-conscious first-person lived experience, um, which has to be uh, put in a, a close relation with uh, what occurs at the physiological cardiac level. Um, well, I will skip that, and also that. Sorry, <laughs> it's a bit too much, and. Uh, <laughs> And maybe just to, uh, to, to say things a bit uh, uh, in a very uh, uh, dense way, uh, the idea was to understand surprise as uh, an, uh, both attentional and emotional dynamic in order to refine the expression of cognitive emotion, which is uh, uh, probably um, uh, uh, difficult as such, and uh, also to, uh, to take distance from uh, the idea of uh, surprise as a primary emotion and also as a uh, mere cognitive process. So to, these two understandings uh, are probably uh, too uh, partial 
uh, need to be uh, uh, re-understood as a, as, a, as a more complex uh, level uh, in this kind of uh, attentional emotional uh, dynamic, which uh, 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 enables to, uh, um, to explore further, which uh, we didn't uh, do it uh, right now, but it would be interesting to do it now, uh, to explore within this dynamic of surprise uh, specific uh, forms of emotion, so state emotions like joy and disgust, uh, which we, uh, uh, we could see uh, uh, named by some of the subjects that uh, were uh, taking part in the experiment, uh, who uh, uh, mentioned uh, uh, surprise, a surprise of uh, disgust, or a, a disgust being understood as a surprise, but bees being associated to surprise, or a surprise of fear. Um, in Adam Smith, for example, we find this uh, expression of surprise of joy, which is quite interesting because it, uh, it clearly indicates that for, for uh, Smith, uh, surprise is not an emotion, but may bring about a, kind of a specific emotion, like joy, like fear, like disgust. Um, other kinds of uh, uh, emotions without time embedded emotions, which you, you mentioned a bit, Laura, I think, uh, like tension, volitions, desire, wish, which have uh, quite different uh, qualities as uh, what we could call state emotions. And also other kinds of emotions which are m more high cognitive, you also mentioned them, uh, curiosity, ast astonishment, perplexity. Uh, and also, I didn't mention, mention them here, but emotions with, which are more ambivalent, like uh, uh, the, the, the experience of uh, something weird or something that's, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Freud said, uh, unheimlich, uh, kind of the strangeness of something that you can't identify. And uh, I, would, I would put this kind of emotion into some uh, uh, um, uh, high, high cognitive process, uh, but still including uh, uh, an emotional uh, um, dimension that should, uh, uh, to, my, uh, to my view, should be also explored further. Um, and, um, and so uh, uh, this uh, understanding of uh, surprise as a dynamic includes these different uh, forms of emotion and uh, they, they would need uh, uh, probably specific studies. Each of them would need specific studies. So uh, of course it's, uh, it's uh, <laughs> beyond the scope of this uh, presentation. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> So Pascal Talenteau is the director of the Centre Gilles Saint-Granger, a professor of philosophy at Aix at Marseille University. He's an expert on Greek philosophy, especially the philosophy of the Enlightenment, critical thinking, etc. And he's also working on philosophy of religion. And this is the topic of today's talk so because he's going to speak about the case of enthusiasm. So as some books, so he wrote uh, a book on Anthony Collins, so Discourse de la Liberté de Penser, and he also produced a new translation with notes, etc., on that view to suicide. And the last book that he was very interested in is uh, uh, on Activité physique et exercice spirituel, Essay de philosophie du sport. So he's working also in the relationship between uh, matter, soul, immortality, and stuff like this. So, Thank yes. you very much for coming. Uh, hi, I'm sorry for not having a marvelous PowerPoint like this. Uh, I had no time to prepare it. So uh, you are going to uh, listen to a kind of sermon in a classic style. <laughs> it's a lecture, so it's adequate to the object, the 18th century philosophy. So thank you, Laura, for inviting me to give this lecture on, on a subject I'm not uh, at all a specialist uh, of. Nevertheless, my relative ignorance of the huge amount of recent academic developments and subtleties about such a hot topic allows me to ask myself a couple of naive questions about what is at stake. And as you probably know, naive questions are in philosophy the most difficult. So let's begin with this one. Let's assume provisionally that we know what an emotion is. 
What is that gives an emotion an epistemic character? I'm not at ease at all with uh, this notion. Uh, does, that, does that mean that some emotions have such a character that other emotions have not? Uh, rough, roughly, curiosity will obtain, will obtain, but not anger or fear. Is it just the feeling of knowing something? Is it the idea that emotions helps us to get a certain knowledge of an object? What is precisely meant by epistemic? So, uh, it seems to me that in a narrow sense, epistemic should mean involved in the building of science or objectively true propositions relating to a world, be it a world of concepts or state of affairs. But the classic theory to the challenge, for instance, by Israel Scheffler, is that emotions are, on the one side, usually, usually linked with strong and vehement passions, disturbing bodily disorders, while episteme, on the other side, is a product of cold reason and self-control over our epistemic attitude, so that epistemic emotions, in that sense, are a kind of paradox or even an oxymoron. A way I see for emotions to gain some sense for us humans in that narrow context is as a byproduct of the psychological nature of epistemic process in embodied minds like the Eureka feeling, the libido sandy, the joy of discovery, the feeling of doubt, and so on. These are signs of an, an epistemic devotion of the knowing subject, but we observe that in the building of objective science. Many tasks are nowadays performed by machines, like computing, deliberating, data mining, but also observing and automatically producing data. This shows that emotions are not necessary conditions of science building in this narrow sense in many aspects of that science. They can accompany this process in the minds of the rational animals that we are and be helpful in a way but not epistemically relevant to the core of what science is. In the history of philosophy, a feeling of emotion I see that could have deserved the name of epistemic emotion in its highest sense, and that echoes somehow the eureka moment of discovery, is the Cartesian intuition by which truth evidently appears to the mind in a manner so clear that you cannot deny it after an adequate preparation and training to cut off from bodily delusions, of course. This could have been a candidate for an epistemic emotion in the strongest sense, a feeling of truth that is both subjective and objective, being a natural light. But as you know, Leibniz criticized the idea that truth could be revealed by an inner natural feeling, which is by its own nature incommunicable and amounts to nothing else than a strong belief or persuasion. He then paved the way for the idea that ideal science must be freed from psychological conditions so that it could be best performed by machines following automatically or blindly a formal protocol of calculus. On the contrary, in a broader and weaker sense, epistemic should mean involved in the process of epistemic individual and concrete activities, such as actual human deliberation, computation, inquiry, and the like. But here, every emotion, by bringing something close to your attention and consciousness, will have, in this broad sense, an epistemic value. Fear, for instance, could urge you to be mindful of the real nature of what is threatening you in order to avoid or neutralize it, even if in the case of panic fear, this knowledge and reaction are quite instinctive. This is a weaker sense of epistemic than previously. It means relative to general cognition, not necessarily a conscious one, and the knowledge gained by these is relative to me or to my cognitive condition. It's not, in a classic sense, a real knowledge. It's not a science. In other words, it is a belief it is the ascent of the mind to a proposition of which I feel the truth of. I was struck in the epistemic emotions literature by the melting of problems coming from the analysis of belief and those issued 
of the so-called epistemic emotions. For instance, Roger Puivet said that an emotion has an epistemic character through intentionality, because believing that something is true, a bear is dangerous, is a condition for an emotion to raise fear, thus supposing that every emotion has an intentional content. The cognitive or epistemic content of some emotions will lie in the manner the mind is directed towards an object through a belief. But saying that beliefs are intentional, they are always beliefs of something, doesn't amount to say that emotion is unless, unless we assume that beliefs are emotion. And this is the human point of view, and a special one. So what are the relations between emotions and feelings? Emotions and beliefs, are emotions really intentional? What is epistemic in epistemic emotions? What I want to do now is to use these questions as guidelines in the analysis of a specific emotion, or perhaps it's not an emotion, but something else, enthusiasm in the context of the late 17th and early 18th century religious, philosophical, and theological thought. This is an emotion that is not much discussed in the philosophical analysis of epistemic emotions today. Enthusiasmus, enthusiasm, enthusiasmus, literally the essence of God inside me, and theos usia, is a Greek word for a feeling of being directly inspired or if even possessed by some God. Nowadays, it is recognized positively as a strong and euphoric interest in something, just like when I say I'm a fan of something. But behind the fan were once the fanatics. In the 17th century England, enthusiasm was the main feature of many Protestant sects that sustained the Great Rebellion or Civil War in the 1640s and whose violence brought afterward disgrace on them. Leibniz noted in these new essays the ambivalence, the ambiguity of the term. I quote, enthusiasm, said he, was at first a good name, signifying that there is a God in us, est Deus in nobis. And then he adds, but men, having dedicated their passions, their fantasies, their dreams, and even their fury to something divine, enthusiasm began to signify a disturbance of the mind. Since then, we attribute this name to those who believe without grounds that their movements come from God. So here we have some interesting features. Enthusiasm is clearly characterized as an emotional state, being the sign of a strong and moving passion. Enthusiasm has a clear relation to belief in general and specifically to this archetype of intellectual belief that we call faith. There is a God inside me. Enthusiasm has an epistemic value. I know my belief is true because, for instance, I know that God is truth and truthful, so through theology, I know my belief is true. I know that he turned some men into prophets through the Bible. I know that faith is a direct and individual link to God through the religious tenets of Protestantism, for instance, Augustine's Deo Interior Intimo Meo, the inner God is more intimate to me than myself. Of course, rational minds would say it's just a case of delirium and religious delusion, a proper object for medicine rather than philosophy or religion per se. Thus, Henry Moore, in his book, Enthusiasmus Triumphatus, uh, in 1656, defined enthusiasm, quote, a misconceit of being inspired, caused by an excess of black bile, that is, classically, a melancholic state that would be today called 
a bipolar disorder. But making enthusiasm a disease is not the point. The point is that whatever the real cause of these outbursts of religious emotion may be, these emotions are interpreted and given significance by the subject himself following a structure or a system of beliefs, these religious tenets forming a religious context in which these emotions are supposed to take place in order to be justified or legitimate. It is Moore's definition of enthusiasm as a misconceit itself that induces us to remove enthusiasm from the medical context, medicine being here a dead end for a philosophical analysis, a way to deprive enthusiasm of all cognitive or epistemic content and value. In the words of the time, these men were, quote, crack-brained enthusiasts. A misconceit is an archaic term that echoes Leibniz's talk about groundless beliefs, without ground. It's a misconception, a wrong idea or impression about something leading to a wrong judgment. I have the idea that something is something that it really cannot be. In the case of enthusiasm, my false belief is that my emotions are proofs of my being divinely inspired. What is true is that I am aware that something happens in me and that I feel strong emotions. What is false is my asserting this something and associated emotions to be caused by divine intervention. So we are here in the rationalistic realm of grounding beliefs, the building of grounded judgments about things, or how to estimate the degrees of probability and adjust precisely our assent to them. This is the way John Locke tried to confute enthusiasm. He added in the fourth edition of the essay in 1700, a whole chapter devoted to the refutation of the claim of enthusiasts to be divinely inspired just because they feel that this is the case. So in Lockean terms, they give a wrong assent to the judgment, I am inspired by God because So, wrong ascent because, because uh, I quote, um, though founded neither or, uh, on reason nor divine revelation, but rising from the conceits of a warmed and overweening brain, works yet, where it once gets footing, more powerfully on the persuasions and actions of men than either of those two or both together, men being most forwardly obedient to the impulses they receive from themselves, and the whole man is sure to act more vigorously where the whole man is carried by a natural motion. For strong conceit, like a new principle, carries all easily with it when got above common sense, and freed from all restraints of reason and check of reflection, it is heightened into a divine authority in concurrence with our own temper and inclination. So, the reason why Locke addresses the problem of enthusiasm so fiercely has many historical aspects, both philosophic and theological. The polemic against innate ideas, against the seeing all things in God of Father Malebranche, against mystical irrationalism and against anti-Christian deism. Our goal here is not to unravel the matter that you see is very uh, complicated. What is at stake is the casting out the emotions of the rational process of grounding belief because as an incommunicable and subjective feeling, it's a false measure of probability that amounts when expressed to a circular justification. 
I firmly believe something is true because I warmly feel that it is so and I warmly feel that it is so because I firmly believe it is true. In Locke's words, this is the way of talking of these men. They are sure because they are sure and their persuasions are right only because they are strong in them. Instead of establishing the probable ground of belief I could expose and discuss with other people, which is the most I can do in the twilight of probability we live in and that constitutes all my reasonableness, I pin my faith on the degree of emotion, warmness, firmness, strength I feel when I imagine my belief to be true. So, passion, desire and interest being entirely subjective are, to lock, enemies to reason because reason requires intersubjective control. It is built by a community. So, of course, if you remember the title of this famous Elvis Presley album, 50 million Elvis fans can't be wrong, you will understand, as Locke did, that enthusiasm is also a social contagious disease, the therapy of which consists above all in education and the establishing a system of rational religious belief like the one he proposes in the reasonableness of Christianity, which is a rational uh, exegesis of Christian revelation. This book and the other book of the conduct of the understanding and some thoughts concerning education constitute the pillars of Locke's intellectual reform for depriving enthusiasm of the system of beliefs he needs. But the case does not end there. Let's see what happens now, and which is the most interesting, and the most interesting, in a context in which, and a very close context to this one, in which enthusiasm as a feeling appears far more positively once stripped of those gloomy features of religious fanaticism and superstition. The context is the early 18th century rational theology. In a word, rational theology, if something like that exists, is an attempt to prove by reason alone the existence and nature of a deity, the ultimate goal being to give a ground of belief for Christian revelation. Yeah? If reason proves that there is a God as an intelligent and benevolent creator, we can easily admit it could have been revealed to us through a special message. So that's uh, the, the basic structure. Now, the proof that is commonly used to perform these tasks in the early 18th century is the famous argument from design. There are many versions of this tireless argument, but most of the time, in a post-Newtonian context and skipping secondary premises, it goes like this. Everything in the universe is designed like a machine, showing means adapted to ends. Two, only an intelligence can design and create a machine by adapting means to, means to ends. Three, therefore, the universe was designed and created by a being, intelligent and powerful enough to do so. That is, ta-da, a god. Sure, it is. So it is obvious that this argument is flawed in many ways. Hume did a great job in these dialogues to show that. You cannot draw from the premises of a finite, incomplete, and ambiguous experience of the world an infinitely powerful and designing cause without a major leap that resembles a fallacy. But this is not the interesting point, on the contrary. The interesting point is that Despite all, the of the, all of the rational criticism you can address to it, the argument survives and stays convincing for many, mind, with many minds with a strength you can't escape. And this was precisely Hume's goal, not to refute the arguments, but to show that reason, despite its success in destroying every part of it, cannot help our belief to be molded and increased by it. 
at the end of the dialogue, perhaps if you know this book, Philo, the skeptical character, does his teleological coming out. Uh, the quote is uh, worth to be uh, lengthful. The most, uh, so it's Philo, uh, supposedly uh, Hume, the skeptic. The most careless, the most stupid thinker sees everywhere a purpose, an intention, a design. And no man can be so hardened in absurd systems as to reject that at all times. It is with, with pleasure that I hear Galen reason concerning the structure of the human body. The anatomy of a man, he says, reveals more that, than 600 different muscles. And anyone who studies these will find that in each of them, nature must have taken into account at least 10 different circumstances in order to achieve the end that he proposed, right shape, right size, right disposition of the several ends, the upper and lower position of the whole muscle, the proper insertions of the various nerves, veins, and arteries, so that in the muscles alone, more than 6,000 different plans and intentions must have been formed and carried out. He calculates that there are 245 bones and that the structures of each of them aims at more than 40 purposes. What an enormous display of planning, even in this simple and homogeneous parts. But if we consider the skin, ligaments, blood vessels, glands, bodily fluids, the various limbs and members of the body, how our astonishment must increase in proportion to the number and intricacy of the parts so artfully related to one another. As we go further in these researches, we discover new scenes of skill and wisdom. A scientist today must indeed be stubbornly obstinate if he can doubt that there is a supreme intelligence. Are you converted? <laughs> so, okay. so the feelings described here, admiration, pleasure, growing astonishment and surprise, full conviction, are indeed in this context akin to epistemic emotions or affections of the mind that gives a drive toward, towards knowledge. Nevertheless, Philo in the text quoted above is not converting to rational theology. In fact, he is pasticing a whole bunch of rational theologians devoted to physical theology like Samuel Clark in the Boyle Lectures. The way Clark develops his argument from design to convince us that the first cause is an intelligence, and that's what rational religion as a religion is all about, shows that where reason must stop, a special rhetorical device is required, is required to bring our ascent to a higher level through the producing of these emotions. This rhetoric consists in the accumulation of various instances of design in plants animal, human body, planet motions, until such a finality bombing begins to exert its binding effect on the mind. Quote Clark, the more men observe and make discoveries, the more this argument reinforces. This is very paradoxical, how a rational argument can be reinforced increased in strength by experiences that are, in fact, always the same. You see some design here, here, and here, and here, and here, but it's always the same. It's the accumulation that counts. That's why Hume's text was purposefully long and redundant. Reason itself, in the argument of design in the early 18th century, is ravished by enthusiasm and allies with imagination and sensibility to reach God, the obscure object of desire. So feelings become a path to knowledge and reason becomes a way to feel. 
This rhetoric, of course, is that of sermons and apologetic discourses. Shaftesbury, dealing in the moralist characteristics, so early, it's uh, 1711, with what he calls a new enthusiasm, caught the spirit of the times in the transformation and enlargement of the concept, making enthusiasm the highest degree of love and admiration, of which the fundamental epistemic virtue that Locke called the love of truth is a part and is best represented by the scientific enthusiasm of the Royal Society scientists that were called the virtuosi, that is the most excellent of virtuous men. I quote Shaftesbury, all love and admiration is enthusiasm, the transport of the poets, the sublime of the orators, the rapture of the musicians, the high strains of the virtuosi, all mere enthusiasm, even learning itself, the love of art and curiosity, all, all enthusiasm. He was an enthusiast himself. So, in that sense, enthusiasm is a good candidate for the title of, of the foremost epistemic emotion of 18th century. And while Kant doesn't mention, uh, or very scarcely the name, uh, the Schwermerei being odious to him, he is peculiarly sensitive of the importance of the design argument in the defense of what he calls the good cause, that is, the defense of the rational possibility of God upon whom morality is grounded. That is why, I quote Kant here, and be careful to the last part of the <laughs> sentence, this proof always deserves to be named with respect it is the oldest, clearest, and the most appropriate to common human reason. It enlivens the study of nature just as it gets its existence from this study and through it receives an ever-renewing force. It brings, in an, it, it brings in ends and aims where they would not have been discovered by our observation itself and extends our information about nature for the guiding thread of a particular unity whose principle is outside nature. But this acquaintance also reacts upon its cause, namely the idea that occasioned it, and increases the belief in a highest author to the point where it becomes an irresistible conviction. To increase the belief to the point it becomes an irresistible conviction, though the proofs are necessarily missing in the strictest epistemological sense, this is the effect of the enthusiasm. If beliefs are basically propositions we give our assent to, the main problem of belief is the grounding of the predication. When the ground of belief is itself built and comforted, by arousals and raptures caused by a representation of its object, then there is faith. To be sure, Kant's pure reason is enlivened by impure desires. To know what it cannot know, that is, the unconditioned. But this characterization of common human reason as affected by the show of design, contrivance or fitness in nature, as if it was an objective truth, bears testimony of how positive enthusiasm through the 18th century deeply transformed the idea of reason itself from an impartial inner light and judge taming bodily passions into a rational way to search the unknown with hopes and faith. So let's draw some bold conclusions from these uh, historical premises. First, it seems to me, uh, in analyzing all these texts, um, that emotion is the name we give to the rays in the degree of perception we have of a certain feeling. This rays of our inner feelings and passion is what our conscience notice, because when it moves up, it moves you. And that's what emotions are all about. An emotion of is in fact, from its form, 
a huge variation in the degree, force, strength, or vivacity of the impression made by a certain object. This is clear in 18th century literature, including philosophy, when you look at the definition that, Don that Johnson gives in his dictionary, confirming the general use of emotion in that sense. I quote, disturbance of the mind, vehemence of passion. That is, the highest degree, pleasing or painful, with which a passion appears and moves or shakes the mind. In religious contexts, the believing that God talks directly to me and that I hear an inner voice is said to be, every time, a rapture. A second point, enthusiasm is a compound of feelings, so to say a, a cocktail of basic feelings. This cocktail, this, this high-spirited cocktail, is perfectly mixed for love, love of truth, of course. So enthusiasm was at once a paragon epistemic emotion. The love of scientific truth as an absolute in the early, early 18th century being more or less a secularized version of the absolute truth which emanates from God. Then it became, later, a joyful exaltation suited to rock concerts and football matches. So the way we, we feel about our beliefs and the arousal of our feelings depends largely on the social system of beliefs we're involved and part of. I would say that emotions are signs of a sympathetic reaction to the diffused values and beliefs of a certain society, and this echoes Aristotle's th thesis in the Nicomachean Ethics about our conditioning through education to feel the appropriate emotions in the appropriate context. Third, if so, epistemic emotion must respond, like all emotion, to a doxastic social context in which episteme, truth, knowledge, rationality, and the like are valued, highly valued or not, so that in my feelings about them, uh, uh, so my feeling about them could, in certain circumstances, be raised into an emotion and drive my action. The transformation of the religious enthusiasm into a positive or Shaftesburian type bears testimony of the emergence of new values in the 18th century. Society, sociability, taste, and aesthetics need to be comforted by the, inventions, the invention of new emotive cocktails. Every emotion that signals an interest of the individual toward the bonds of society deserve to be labeled epistemic or epidemic if knowledge is above all and by its own nature something that is capable to be shared. And that is the sense of objectivity. Thank you. Yes, it's quite confusing. It becomes a circle when expressed. So when these guys try to explain what they feel, what they do, what they think, it becomes a circle. Because at that time, they're trying to... to, to no, that's so, so because they, they find... No, that's right. Uh, of, uh, of Uh, 
Yes, in the context of the design argument, they were absolutely confident of the success of this argument because of the new discoveries. Yeah. It's a post-Newtonian uh, theme. It's, t it's, a, it's, a, it's a hot topic at the, at the times. Yeah. Newton has just explained the perfect system of nature with uh, bringing to life uh, this new uh, phenomenon of a, uh, universal attraction. And so we see that there, are, there, there is intelligibility in nature that, that can be... Um, that can be uh, expressed in mathematical terms. So science and religion seems to go uh, hand in hand, you know. That's why that's why it works. But um, uh, fact, very interesting fact is that the, the major instances are taken from uh, biology, because uh, this is uh, far more striking than astronomy. In uh, astronomy, you see the regularities uh, of the planets. Uh, long time ago, you see them uh, with the observations of astronomers, but uh, in the biology, new phenomena uh, are discovered every, every day. So, what counts is uh, really this idea that flying from success to success, uh, you, after a moment, you are not aware that you are flying. You know, on the wings of uh, the, the Kanchen dough. You're flying, but experience is not supporting you because you are going to make a conclusion that is not uh, whatever you can do and whatever the amount of experiences you have be drawn from the premises. From the premises. That's why, from a strict rational point of view, a logical point of view, the argument doesn't op obtain, but it works nevertheless. So th this is uh, the, the, the fact that, uh, that impressed uh, uh, Clark and Shaftesbury. And this fact is linked also with the, the discovery uh, of uh, George Barclay, of, of, it's not a discovery from George Barclay, but trying to, to, to ground philosophically the power of language. The reflection on uh, persuasion and uh, how to convince uh, s uh, someone with, uh, with arguments, the, the pure power of uh, rhetoric. So the, re the rhetoric of the sermons is, uh, is changing. In, in, uh, in, in these years. They are incorporating bits of science. Uh. So I have a remark, maybe a question, I'm not too sure about it. So it seems to me that the main problem for enthusiasm for these authors is that you do not really own these emotions. So there is a problem of self-mastery. So it seems to me that they criticize enthusiasm because they are taking this as a kind of emotivism strong emotivism and stuff like this. And so maybe the problem is because these are, these are too extreme, you can say, emotion, but a more Aristotelian and distinct emotion that is regulated with the pattern of physics yes. can work very mm -hmm. well. So, and the question could be, are they addressing the question as uh, challenging the emotivist uh, and I have this in mind as uh, the idea of reason as a self-mastery in, in this way? This could and then uh, you, spoke, you say something about admiration and uh, enthusiasm. I think that uh, they are quite different if we take this uh, point of view of self-mastery. Because when we admire someone, we are the subject of admiration. I am you, you admire you, etc. But uh, in the enthusiasm, when I'm totally inspired by someone, the real subject is the others, not anymore myself. As when we, we are falling in love, Right? So totally is toward the object, we are taken by the object, I'm not anymore within myself, and in admiration it seems that I can still have a kind of ownership. So I don't see very much this similarity between admiration and enthusiasm. And yes, and then I had also another reference to the last things that you said about persuasion. So I think that this has to do not only with uh, God, it is God the object that uh, takes us, but also if I think about Plato and his discussion in the Ion when the poets are so good or the writers themselves of taking us through this wonderful and beautiful discourse. And so again, we uh, are losing our uh, ownership, the capacity of maintaining our thoughts in uh, general. Mm. So I don't know. <laughs> the, the question of self-mastery uh, is an important one because uh, 
control over one's feeling uh, is said to be classically uh, an epistemic virtue. We know that. Um, the fact is that uh, in this uh, context, uh, if I describe this new enthusiasm, which has uh, roots in the older enthusiasm, but uh, deprived uh, of mm -hmm. all the, the religious uh, clothes, uh, um, uh, Hume said something very important. He, he, says, he says this. This is uh, just uh, two words, but these are very important. Uh, he says, uh, no man can be so hardened in absurd systems, rational criticism of skeptical criticism of, uh, of this uh, design argument, as to reject that, I see purpose, intention, at all times. It's to a point I can, I can to a point. But I am not uh, mastering myself enough, I, I can't master my own nature enough to be everywhere, at any time, uh, design-proof. Mm -hmm. And why cannot, can't I do that? Because building something with finality is the, the intimate structure of my reason. When I do something, I do it on purpose. If not, it's irrational. So I recognized, in a way, the way I act as a human mind in nature, or perhaps it's an illusion or not. This is another debate. It's a Kantian one, in fact. But this is a very important point. That I, am, I can't master my own nature all the time. I, I can be taught how to be careful, how to be a um, kind of a very, very uh, careful researcher, uh, not to give my assent too quickly, etc., etc. But I can't help sometimes being <laughs> ravished. You know, but by this argument that echoes so uh, intimately my uh, my own nature. Uh, so th this is a point uh, for you. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't talk yeah. about him, but uh, he has things to to say about emotion. I think uh, as impressions. Yes, this one. Uh, I have a quote. Yeah. And then I think again, and I think I agree with this quote. Uh, I like the the it's an inspiration. Absolutely. Losing oneself is good for acquisition of knowledge and to remove the, the sort of thing that it has been used in the sense of to, to characterize the false belief. Okay? Yes. But it doesn't mean that as an epistemic tool, I mean, on the other hand, it's not still kind of a, a good one to, to remove the false belief of God. But I take this false belief of. Uh, yes, yes. This false belief, uh, as they, they, they say, as a way to describe a situation where, where the I, so I, I think this is a term from that side, where the I disappears. Uh -huh. When I do research, when I do, when I acquire knowledge and I really think in three application terms, you, you climb up something where the I disappears. So yeah. it's good in itself that the I is disappearing and then I interpret the Greek term as the fact that the connection to God makes you disappear. Yes. Something along this no, line. The, the, yes. On the other, it may be for this singular uh, problem, you know, not all of them, but it may be, it's not on the other, which is problematic, this, uh, the, 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 the fact that you describe the disparition of the self by the proximity to God and the existence yeah. of God. But if you remove this and you still use uh, this enthusiasm as a, you know, you know, I don't know, it's a kind of a something that helps you master without with, uh, the disparition of God. Disappearition of yourself, then maybe. Yes, yeah, I like this, uh, this God description because it, for me, I interpret it as a disparition of the I. Yes, or, or the self, because it, it's another name for the work of the unconscious sometimes. Yes. Something, something speaks in me. Yes. And sometimes I have an idea of the genius uh, kind of. Uh, of ideas, you know, original, but where does it come from? I don't know. It's an inspiration of the God. I don't know, but it's sub subconscious. That's right. Your point is interesting to, uh, to notice that uh, enthusiasm, like Leibniz said, 
was uh, at first a good name, mean, meaning uh, in, in the Greek civilization uh, that with the bodily preparation, mm. Mm, some drugs, uh, some uh, you know, you dance, drugs, etc. You let the God free to appear uh, in you as you are, in fact, in a state of delirium. So the, the same state in the 17th century is, uh, is, uh, is un understood as a, as a pathologic state, state of delirium. Huh? Uh, to the Greeks, it was the proof that uh, you are going to be inspired. You know, something happens in, in the body. So that was positive and then negative, but uh, the difference is uh, Christianity uh, that, uh, and, and the special demands Christianity put on our reason because uh, the notion of faith is not the same uh, between uh, 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 Christianity rationalized and uh, uh, Greek religion, of course. To strive. Yes. My, my, my body feel feel possessed, uh, or I am possessed. That's true. Yeah. Just we need to remark. We will have a discussion to discuss, but the concept of concept of system of. Religious enthusiasm is the same for aesthetic enthusiasm. Yeah. Uh, common sense, the internal sense of this American side. But, uh, and um, the latter concerning enthusiasm and the, um, the view is also about enthusiasm. Yeah. Uh, Morris uh, takes uh, an extraordinary example of uh, the, the correctness between us. Uh, religious and aesthetic. Perhaps it's something like being surprised by myself. So I can say it's myself. So it's another thing. God or Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have a 15 minutes break. It's uh, our last session, and uh, we are glad to uh, welcome uh, uh, Philip Buchner uh, from Fry uh, University of Zurich. And uh, he uh, is a specialist in APEX studies, uh, a member of a collaborative research center about affected societies. And uh, uh, he has uh, uh, published a different uh, a paper about uh, affective arrangement, for example, in uh, National Review, and uh, uh, on uh, also uh, uh, on uh, conceptual articulation and powers of judgment in affect and emotional research. research. So it's a perfect thing to talk about. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Well, let's see how perfect it's going to be. Um, so today I want to present a theoretical concept that we call the effect of arrangements. And it's a concept that I have, um, colleagues and I have developed over some time now, uh, working in and for in this interdisciplinary research group um, called Effective Societies. Um, and I especially want to address our experiences as philosophers in such a transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary setting and the way how we understand our conceptual work uh, within such a setting and the varying uses that this concept has found among non-philosophical colleagues of ours and, uh, and friends of ours. So when I talk about effective arrangements as a concept beyond philosophy of emotion, I don't mean, really don't mean to imply that philosophy of emotion or philosophy uh, itself is something useless, is something to be left behind and should be replaced. Uh, by something newer, fancier strands of theory like the recent um, ethic theory, I really do mean beyond in the sense of transdisciplinarity. How do concepts, uh, as a philosopher, I would be much stricter 
um, uh, than I am today. And this also means that I won't present an ontological account about um, ethic versus emotion and the ontological differences between uh, them, although I will talk about ontology, but more from a praxeological account of working uh, with concepts of emotion and ethic in two different interdisciplinary settings. So I don't really speak as a philosopher today, but as more of an eclecticist, if you want. Um, I draw from my own experiences uh, in two such interdisciplinary research groups. The former excellent research cluster languages of emotion that sadly doesn't exist anymore. Um, parts of it have survived as the Balam Institute for Neuroimaging of Emotion and the already mentioned um, CRC effective societies. The difference between an ERC and a CRC are not important outside German academia. Um, and this, I'm sorry, this is in German, probably you can't read it anyways, but these are the disciplines that are involved. So we're working with um, anthropologists, sociologists, <coughs> film, literature, media, and theater studies, as well as with art historians, psychologists, political sciences, and of course, philosophers, and that we have to bring under one umbrella. And I will briefly only um, talk about an application to the field of aesthetic emotions for the simple reason that before today I did not really know uh, what they were. I had a vague understanding. Now I know more about it. Um, but I didn't know enough to give an, my own account on what that would be. Um, so the first thing to understand is that affect and emotion, in my view, signify not different things, but different perspectives. And I want to begin with what one could call the emotion paradigm. Um, that's the paradigm that the cluster languages of emotion worked with. And they researched things like how are emotions shaped by <coughs> languages, not only la natural languages, but also gestures, songs, chants you hear in sports arenas, images, poetry, art, music, and so on. Um, they also asked what are the effects of proficiency or lack thereof in those languages, like reading skills, multilingualism, empathy, um, and how does that affect the emotion experience, emotion expression, but also learning, understanding, and other cognitive performances. That was the kind of work uh, they did. Now, Affective Societies takes a different approach. It addresses not so much individual emotions, but rather the question, how does affectivity um, actually constitute communities and societies, institutions, and even economies? And how is affectivity in turn then shaped by those uh, institutions? And um, especially, what kinds of uh, subjectivity do uh, does affectivity uh, produce in such setting? And there's a special focus on um, moments of transition and change, for example, in revolutions and uprisings, uh, moments of social change, um, and so on. Um, so I'll stick with the languages of emotion uh, group for a bit. They had a fairly complex understanding of emotions. They were not simplistic, not at all. Um, they understood emotions as culturally embedded. And they asked overall two very simple questions. The first one is, what are emotions? And the second one, what are the effects on certain aspects of life, for example, learning? And I didn't find any example from their work because all the home pages are gone by now. Um, but I found two random, uh, more or less random examples from the field of epistemic emotion, which exemplify this approach quite nicely. Uh, the first one is from a, a paper of psychologists in Canada, in uh, McGill University in Quebec. Um, and they research the role of epistemic emotions in personal epistemology and self-regulated learning. And they mean something if you Google facts and educate yourself uh, via Google um, what emotions are involved in uh, these practices. And they start their paper, or the abstract they give is they say what they're going to do. We define epistemic emotions. We describe under what conditions epistemic emotions arise and delineate how these emotions may facilitate or constrain learning processes and learning outcomes. Specifically, we present five antecedents to epistemic emotions and five consequences of those emotions during learning. The five antecedents are control, value, novelty, complexity, and um, achievement or impasses of epistemic aims. And the five consequences are effects on planning and goal setting, motivation, cognitive and metacognitive strategies, learning outcomes, 
and we end with a discussion of educational implications and future, future directions for research. Um, I want you to focus not so much about um, what they're, they're saying content-wise, um, but just how they arrange um, neatly into conditions and consequences and separate them sort of uh, in, a, in a more or less causal um, manner. And the next, um, the next example is from a project for a philo uh, proposal for a philosophical project in Zurich um, by two philosophers. And uh, they write, beside emotions and feelings, desires, character traits, moods, and affective dispositions are different kinds of affective states. Given this effect of diversity, we can legitimately wonder whether some of the so-called epistemic emotions or epistemic feelings have not been wrongly classified. That means whether some of the so-called epistemic emotions or epistemic feelings are not correct characterized by a different affective nature. The affective nature of curiosity is especially controversial. D'Souza and Brady regard, as, regard it as an epistemic feeling and Morton as an epistemic emotion, whereas other philosophers consider curiosity to be a desire um, of a specific kind. Here again, I'm not so much concerned with the content of what they're saying, but I want you to know the emphasis that is um, put on differentiating um, and making differences what exactly an epistemic emotion is and that there are desires and traits in different states that can be um, distinguished. Um, so if we paint a very generic picture of the emotion paradigm, statements like these uh, are likely to pop up. Emotions are single affective episodes or states. They can be differentiated from other states like desires and so forth. They are understood as belonging to individuals. Um, they have names or classifications, fear, curiosity, anger, shame, and so on. Um, they are directed at objects, concrete or abstract. They, they have intentionality, we would say, fear, fire, curiosity, about chemistry, and so on. And they have effects on actions, judgments, and beliefs. I'm not saying that all researchers would agree on all these statements. I know, for example, Laura wouldn't uh, agree with many of those. Um, but it's just the kinds of statements that you would hear when you do work within um, philosophy of emotion. And they have a question that sort of underlying question that goes um, um, with this kind of research, and that question would be, what goes on in an individual X in a given situation Y? That's the sort of idea. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately generic here. Um, now, as I said, the researchers of the cluster languages uh, of emotion, they really did excellent work. They worked on autism and, and quite impressive what they did. I'm actually quite proud that I worked with them. Um, however, there were three particular kinds of difficulties that they ran into. And it's funny because they didn't concern the single projects. When they did their work on their own, they actually did fine. Uh, these problems popped up, they surfaced when we had to write the application for the renewal for founding. And where we both had to claim relevance and we had to like offer a um, conceptual umbrella for all the 20 disciplines. This is when suddenly we realized we were researching maybe completely different things. And so I want to name these um, uh, difficulties. The first one I would call an ontological overkill concerning emotions. Um, so the different disciplines never really managed to agree on the simple question, what is an emotion? Quite frankly, they just didn't. Um, but at the same time, while they didn't agree, there was a never-ending flood of more and more conceptual differentiations um, into feelings, sensations, moods, background emotions, collective emotions, shared emotions. Um, and I'm not saying that they didn't make sense, these differentiations. It was just that they made it, made it even more, less likely to find common ground. Um, Oops. The second uh, problem I would call an ontological deficiency concerning power and society. This especially was true when we came to the point of um, claiming relevance for our research. Um, so uh, if emotions are indeed embedded, embodied, and active and extended, like we heard today, um, what role then does, for example, disembedding dis through migration play? What role does do different racializing body politics uh, play? 
What is the question of political agency? Uh, and if they extend it by tools, what's the role of socioeconomic access to certain tools? Um, and so on. And a related um, problem to the second one, uh, one could call ontological abstraction. Um, many of the current political and social events was just during the Arab Spring um, when we wrote this application. And many political and social events at that time that seemed really worthwhile discussing in terms of the emotional and affective dimension did not seem to fall easily into the psychological framework of the emotion paradigm. Either because those instances did not fit the simple dichotomy of individual and situation, or because the experienced affectivity did not fall into any classificatory register of single emotions. You could not name it, you could not say this is only about shame, for instance. Um, or thirdly, because you would have to look at a whole economy, a whole dynamic of a messiness uh, of different affects and emotions to address um, what you wanted to address. Uh, this was especially true for affects accompanying change, migration, and of mediated uh, forms of uh, affect. And to, I want to be fair because I really liked uh, those people's and uh, people and they were good uh, researchers. The problem is not that these questions could not be answered within the emotion paradigm. I actually believe they could have been answered. The, the problem was that these questions remained systematically unasked somehow. Um, only then by the people who gave the money they asked the question um, and uh, did not give the money. So, and with this, um, I want to turn to the other paradigm, to um, the paradigm of affect, in order to see the differences in approach. And, like, very generally speaking, I put Spinozist and I put it in quotation marks because this is not a lecture on Spinoza, it is just sort of a, a very generic um, uh, characterization of what we did. But more or less, all affect theories, or at least the ones that we work with, are sort of spinocist in nature. And uh, this, is not, um, this is not an easy task because, as some people might know, Spinoza puts forth an entire metaphysical and ontological system. Uh, and without that, the radicalness of affect theory can hardly be understood. Um, and I just want to give, like, uh, the, the, like philosophers will hate me for this, and I apologize, but I give that the most, um, uh, the shortest sort of introduction on Spinoza possible. Um, so, as many of you might know, uh, Spinoza's philosophy can be described somehow paradoxically as a pluralistic monism. Uh, it's monistic <laughs> insofar as there's only one substance. They call it, he calls it God, nature, one could call it also being, so that, that's all there is, just that one thing and everything that we conceive as objects, televisions, bottles, ourselves, and so forth. We are nothing but um, modes of this uh, one substance, and this is where the monism becomes pluralistic because we can conceive of objects as different ways of being, and these ways of being are singular, they're... Um, 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 they're, they're well, they're comparable to others, but they're singular, uh, each and every one of them. Um, and Spinoza, and here it becomes instant, interesting, Spinoza offers another word for mode. Uh, he says, um, it, it uses the word affectio, uh, or affectionis, um, in the sense uh, that every mode uh, of the one substance is just the result of the one substance sort of auto-affecting itself, um, God sort of affecting itself, and by that uh, creating all these modes. And so that's the quote from his um, Ethics, where he writes, by mode I understand the affections of a substance, and we know there is only one, um, or that which is in another to which it is also conceived. And Interesting for us in this defi definition, or useful for us uh, in this definition, is actually um, when we turn it around, um, because we're interested in what uh, affectionis might be, uh, and when we think of the affections of a thing as its modifications, its modulation, if you want. So an, affect an affection of something um, can also be described as a modulation of something. 
Um, and that, to the extent uh, in Spinoza, that what something is in a given moment in time is fully determined by the totality of its affectiones. Um, so this is subjects and things are made by the way um, they are affected. Um, and the result of that is a vertically relational ontology. Um, so we don't talk about particular objects that enter into relations with others, but we talk about a dynamic thicket of relations. This is the first one. And this thicket produces particular uh, objects. Um, so instead of this ontological overkill, now we have a simple ontology for a complex reality. Um, uh, affect as affects you is the result of an encounter or relation between any two or more bodies that leads to a change modulation within these bodies. I found this a very fitting picture of the kind of modulation I think about when I hear um, affects you. And affect as affects you can be understood as the in terms of intensity, the intensity of this change. Um, so what we learn uh, already is that affect as affects you means much more than just feelings or emotions. In fact, it means the excitement that we feel when we step outside, um, but it also means the chill that we feel when the wind touches our skin. Um, also very basic things like being affected by, by light, by perceptions, uh, and even by gravity, you could argue. So really everything that has an, um, an impact on you. Um, so it's a, a greater concept compared to emotion. And this is a, a very stupid painting of a, uh, of a battle, just to give you an uh, impression of how messy um, sort of the, the reality is that we have to understand. Understanding affect as an interplay of affecting and being affected by others does not boil down to a concept which assumes a number of one-directional affections like an individual A affecting B, and then you have a subsequent counter-affection of B on A. That's not the picture, so it's not this reciprocity of single um, impacts, but rather it's an interplay of affecting and being uh, affected um, that is uh, more in terms of an, a resonance um, of, of affect, even to the point of transforming the underlying causality, which is not longer transient, A affects B, but there's an underlying cause that regulates a sort of movement that, um, that we all resonate with. Um, so the question to ask is not so much who's affecting whom, but rather how this relational dynamic of affecting and being affected evolves in sort of the imminence of a given situation. Now there's a important, an important question to be asked from the point of view of persons or human beings, namely, aren't we more than what we are in one situation? Um, aren't we more what we are actually right here, right now? Um, so I told you for Spinoza we could say what we actually are in one given moment is fully realized in the relations which we currently stand. However, um, what we potentially are is always more. Um, and this potentia uh, is also something that's realized already. It's realized in the relations we are able to enter uh, in our capacity to be affected and to affect. So just, and, and this potentia is at the same time determined. So think of an organ like, like uh, and your ears. Your ears can, affect it, can be affected only by sounds. You can, you can show pictures to your ears, but it won't do much. Um, however, within this determination, um, it is infinitively uh, affectable. So there is no limit to the kinds of sounds. Um, of, well, there's, there's many affections as, as, as objects um, around. So you have both a constraint and an, and an infinity. And um, the, the second point you have to um, understand is that this capacity, too, is modulated by, the, by all the affections that we encounter. And um, some of these affections increase our capacity to enter into new relations. Others diminish it. Um, just to give you um, a very easy example, um, for example, if we discuss something with other enthusiastic friends, we might enter into more meaningful relationships with that topic. 
especially if they confront us with new views and sort of that the, the conversation, there's a resonance and it gets more heated, more heated, um, and we, at the end we have more relations to uh, the topic. Um, at the other hand, we also know the case when the presence of other people actually hinder us in really engaging with something and we're better off to just go for a walk alone um, to uh, foster our capacity to relate. Um, and as Spinoza calls, those affections that effectively increase or diminish the capacity of potentia, them he calls affectus. So it's a very similar term for a different, uh, different thing. So while affections are pretty much everything that has an impact on us, affectus are those changes in our capacity to um, relate to other things. Um, and you could say that some of these um, transitions in our capacity, they sort of register they're, they're in, a, in a sort of duration. And in other words, some of these can be called feelings or can be called um, emotions. Um, so we can talk about emotions within the paradigm um, of affect. Um, uh, but that's the, 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 and he does that at length in his ethics, um, but the main point is to um, think of them in terms of, oops, <laughs> uh, to think in terms of uh, relational phenomena. Mm. And this is something that I think um, one could draw some conclusion for that. So any effect just that marks a change in our capacity to engage or relate intellectually with any object, we could maybe call an epistemic effect. I'm not sure about this. Um, but this, this would be one, one way um, to think about the relation of um, epistemic situations and affects. So there are some um, affects that make us intellectually more engaged with the thing. Um, to, to link all this affect stuff back to the emotion paradigm, just very briefly, one could say that the part affect is affectio, takes the place of the situation, which is now understood as absolutely uh, singular, as the effective totality of every relation that modifies or modulates our actual existence in a given moment in time. Um, so right now, I'm trying to affect you. You're inadvertently uh, re-affecting me. Um, and so we hopefully, we can be creating a positive resonance. Um, and we determine how much of my capacity I can realize in this moment is also um, determined by, by your presence and the presence of um, all the things around you. Um, and uh, this, so this, this situation is thought of as dynamic, but still continual uh, in its um, intensity. Uh, and, oops, I'm sorry. And the um, effect as effectus, so the right side, marks moments of sudden change, maybe of surprise, um, in, in the sense that we've uh, talked about it earlier, um, within someone's capacity and the felt difference in intensity. I think it's also that what, what is really uh, looked at in the MRIs when they said they only can compare two states, they don't compare actual things, but differences in, um, in uh, uh, processes in, in, in the brain. Um, and that therefore takes the place of the individual and the emotion paradigm, and which is now seen as transitional and potential, uh, and also as empty as, uh, in, as it was explained in the talk about uh, surprise. Um, and this in turn now, this, this whole picture um, informs, that's what we thought, a basic directive for research, namely the requirement to investigate affect as part of a complex polycentric and spatially temporally extended effective arrangement. So when we when we look at something, we don't look at individuals, but we sort of have to cut out uh, arrangements as object of, of our research. Um, so this it is an artificial cut, but it you know you can give reasons for why you cut, uh, why you make the cut the way um, you do. Um, what well, is an effective arrangement? There's a very short answer. Everything could be. Um, an effective arrangement can be a workplace, 
environment that is designed to boost certain effects like team spirit, like creativity, like competit competitiveness, and lower others. Think of the architecture of uh, how the architecture of uh, offices has changed and how that change in architecture uh, has accompanied changes in the idea of what work should be. Um, public events, events could be effective arrangements, street protests, um, social gatherings of all sorts, and of course also a classroom um, could be uh, an effective arrangement. There's a nice quote from Lauren Berland, um, uh, American uh, literature, um, um, uh, uh, Prophet, thank you. <laughs> um, and she's, she writes, ethics act in the nervous system, not of people, but of worlds. And that's sort of the idea behind an effective uh, arrangement. Um, a, a few key features of effective arrangements. Most importantly, effective arrangements have both a material and expressive or discursive dimension. And these two dimensions can support each other. So you can have an architecture that is in line with, an, with the current ideology, but they can also be characteristically out of sync. They can be subverting each other. All of that is possible. Uh, this uh, picture I took this morning, this is also um, uh, from, from the talk of, of Thomas, um, just to show you that uh, this, of course, is related to, to network thinking. Um, so there's a little quotation here from a Turk, uh, talk from uh, this morning. And the key idea is that an effective arrangement is, as he also said, uh, <coughs> a fragmentary open textured formation of uh, autonomous elements. Uh, so it is very characteristic that the individual elements within such an uh, arrangement, they seemingly act at the same time freely. They're not, it's not someone forcing them think, to do things, um, but at the same time, they are uh, in a way controlled. Now, the elements in such an arrangement are held together not by force, as I said, but by an intensity, um, by an emotional intensity, if you want, in the form of effective resonance or affecting and being affected. It can, therefore, but it doesn't necessarily have to, create an immersive pull um, that keeps you inside the effective arrangement. Um, and although they cannot be sharply demarcated from their surroundings, we don't really know where this group that we are ends like locally. Um, however, you can, there are sensible thresholds of intensity. So you might hide in the corner and then you feel you're a little bit outside. You might go to the toys and you're still sort of in this arrangement. You feel the pull, but you're at the same time, um, you're, you're clearly um, beyond some sort of uh, threshold. And uh, you can uh, see two tendencies. Uh, oh no, sorry, they're performatively open-ended, so they have the capacity to include more elements. Um, and there are two um, sort of counter dynamics that you can find uh, both in an effective arrangement. There's a tendency to ossify, to be very, um, to become very solid, but there are also effective arrangements that tend to um, dissolute after a while. Um, so both of this um, is, is, uh, is very possible. Um, I don't have enough time to go to all, to all the examples. Um, that me and my colleagues work on. This, these are just snapshots. So this is something that someone that I did. I worked on the ankle monitor. Um, so just to give you an idea how material-based arrangement thinking is. Um, so you would pick, um, or you could pick a material object, and you discuss how this object sort of arranges affects. And I uh, did a little work on uh, Foucault's discipline and Tanish and uh, on the role of uh, these, these ankle monitors and how they arrange the feelings of guilt and shame. Um, this is something that my colleagues uh, Rainer Sla uh, Jan Slavi and, and Rainer Mühoff that I um, wrote this paper on effective arrangements with, something that they did. They looked at uh, the Google at a workplace um, and I just give you uh, a little um, quote from someone who 
worked there, and he describes, again, he describes very much the materials, the material objects um, that he encountered. So the dinosaurs and spaceships, so in the Google complex, uh, it looks like a little bit like Jurassic Park, the dinosaurs and their, their spaceships. Um, so it's very pop culturally loaded. Um, and he writes, the dinosaurs and spaceships certainly fit in with the infantilizing theme, uh, as does the hot tub-sized ball pit that Googlers can jump into and throw ball fights. Everyone and everyone I know who works there either acts childish, the army of programmers, enthusiastically adolescent, their managers and overseers, or else is deeply cynical, the hotshot programmers. And now that's the interesting um, conclusion uh, Aaron Schwartz draws. But as much as they may want to leave Google, the infantilizing tactics have worked. They're afraid they wouldn't be able to survive anywhere else. So this is what I mean by immersive pull. Uh, you're in this arrangement, you're acting freely. Nobody's forcing you to go into the ball pool and have ball fights. Uh, it's not that kind of being forced. But somehow you work there, everyone else is doing this, the, the objects around you sort of invite you to, to, to do what everyone else does. Um, and as Spinoza says, you, this, this shapes who you are. It, actu it actualizes you uh, as a subject. So this is a very soft form um, of uh, what Rainer would call immersive power or effective power. Um, this is something also very interesting from our uh, research group from the, um, from the political science uh, scientists there. Um, they examined the, uh, was during the Arab Spring, they examined um, the cases of Egypt and Turkey. Um, and they looked especially, again, they, um, what they focused on was the fact that uh, people gathered at public spaces. Um, what they call, in English it translates, it translates quite funnily in, in, into English like square moments, the German is smooth, that means the, the magic moment being created by the fact that you are at a public square, at a, at a place in an, in an urban surrounding. And again, you have the idea that the, the material size around you um, is what um, sort of arranges um, the affectivity involved. And by comparing the, the two similar cases of uh, Tahir and Taksim, um, they, found, they found similarities, uh, uh, and, but also they found um, differences. Um, and they called this, they called the, the, the square moment, um, or the squares they called um, effective arrangements. So as you can see, and this is, this is the point why I uh, was very um, generic in my introduction. We gave, with this concept, we gave as much leeway to the researchers as possible as how to adopt and how to apply this concept. Um, with regard to the elements that they might choose, um, so you have ankle monitors, you have architectural features, you have urban sites, and also to the types of intensities holding them together, infantilizing, shame, guilt, uh, or political anger, uh, or whatever you might call it. And um, as apparent in this example, at least this is what I hope, uh, with the concept of effective arrangement comes a particular style of thought rather than an ontological decision. Uh, and from there follows a practical as well as a theoretical orientation that lets theorists and researchers approach effective relations in their own manner, emphasizing the aspects and um, connections that they need to emphasize in order to do research um, and to, according to their own heightened sensitivity for the domain that they're doing research in. Um, so from the point of view from arrangement thinking, for example, the question that I started with the, the psychologist who, um, uh, who researched uh, the role of epistemic emotion and self-regulated learning, um, we would say they, they just go very neatly from, from uh, the idea of Googling uh, to self-regulated learning in libraries. 
And so in an arrangement thing, I would say, well, these are two different arrangements. You have like you with the technical uh, apparatus of a computer alone, maybe enraged by the comments you've just read, and you have you yourself reading a book in a quiet library with maybe other serious looking researchers around you, and these things matter. And it's not, you can't just say only because both of those are cases of self-regulated learning, the same emotions uh, do apply. So these, these things matter. Um, just a little hint at a possible application to epistemic emotions. So it seems clear to me that um, from an analytical point of view, um, rather than focusing on any particular individual uh, epistemic emotion, uh, arrangement thinking would put greater emphasis on the epistemic situation addressed as concrete material and as expressive affective arrangement and theorized, theorized on the basic level of ethic as affectio. Um, it would work in case studies rather than in abstract examples and it would seek case studies of non paradigmatic um, nature rather than typical instances. So you would not research your everyday German or French classroom, but for example a classroom or a school in a community where second generation migrants had just entered um, the educational system so that the changes in context become more visible. Um, one would then analyze how these arrangements uh, designed according to, let's say, German traditions and laws and expectations impacted those students who come from different backgrounds, what ethics are encouraged, um, which ones are discouraged by the arrangement, and likewise it would study how, what, what st strategies of subversion um, you could find. Um, Rather than taking a normative approach, talking about the positive side of epistemic virtues, it would take maybe a critical um, approach, asking in what ways are the capacity to intellectually engage in new relations fostered or hindered by this arrangement. Um, what, the W is missing, um, what are the power relations concerning this modulation? And I end, um, with some research that uh, has been done on these questions, not by me, but by Shannon Sullivan um, from her book, Revealing Whiteness. She's a professor of philosophy in North Carolina, and she describes her certain practices of a specific effective arrangement. The university classroom enhances the capacity of some students um, to, affect, to be affected intellectually, intellectually um, which are the same um, moments that diminish the capacity for others. Uh, so I quote, for middle to upper class white people, turn taking in discussions is to be authorized by someone other than the one who wants to speak, the instructor. The polite way to engage in discussions is to raise one's hand and to make one's point in the order in which the instructor recognizes students. For another student to try to speak out of turn or before a prior speaker has finished, making all her points is to interrupt and to be rude. Also, a person does not have doesn't have to have anything important or on topic to say in order to take a turn. Why communities are democratic in allowing everyone to have a turn. Finally, middle to upper class white people tend to think that in discussion their points should be made in the form of a personal, should not be made in the form of a personal argument or an impassioned manner. In their view, to argue effectively means to calmly, dispassionately and objectively state a position without mixing it with personal opinions. In contrast, um, Sullivan believes in black communities, particularly those that are working class, people tend to value individual regulation uh, of when turns are taken. So in a classroom, this means that rather than wait on the instructor to call on people, a person wants to take a turn should do so any time after another makes a first point about which, she, about which she has something relevant and valuable to say. For a speaker to continue making subsequent points, and not let others into the discussion is to antagonize others by hogging the floor. Like my silence on the part of others is often seen as disrespectful during a discussion of a controversial topic, since if someone disagrees with a view, she or he is obliged to speak up. This is because the pursuit of truth is seen as a community enterprise that requires everyone's assistance. Finally, black people, particularly those who are working class tend to value contributions to discussions that are made in a more passionate and personal manner. So here you see that in classroom arranges uh, practices 
in a certain way and thereby doing, doing something on the subjects that are um, in this arrangement. Um, I'm sorry for the, the speed that I ran through this with. If you want to uh, read about this a little bit, in self-regulated learning environment, uh, you can do so by reading two articles that Jan Slavi, Rainer Müller, and I have written. The one is um, on effective arrangements, and the other one is concepts as methodology, uh, a plea for arrangement thinking and the study of affect. Um, that one, that one is just about to be, be published, but I think you find both of them in our respective uh, academia exercise, and I also, if you're interested, I can email them um, to you. Um, that's that. Um, okay, the first one, quite very briefly, um, I, I didn't not many, we stole from many people, we stole from Foucault, we stole from Deleuze um, and uh, other um, arrangement thinkers, um, but um, that, so we, that was, at least, especially in Germany, you find these authors in the cultural studies. There, there was like stupid internal political uh, events in the, in, the, in the early 80s when, when philosophers thought everything that had to do with Nietzsche and irrationality is a, sort of, is a form of fascism out of the German history. That was, that, that's the history, but that's very, uh, very boring. Um, so it's a, I would call it a philosophical re-import because affect is with Spinoza and also with like the, the, the Greek term pathos is a philosophical uh, term, I would say. Um, we were only successful when we tried to be silent about people like Deleuze. So <laughs> when we talk with, with sociologists, um, we would talk, call about, uh, talk about Randall Collins and, and uh, Durkheim. So we tried to um, hide where we stole it from. And that was, um, that is also part of arrangement thinking. You know, sometimes you have to hide uh, certain things. Um, but, so that's, that, but here can be very open. Uh, from sources that we uh, stole it from. And we do, of course, quote them in, in our uh, articles. Um, now about change and where we want to go, uh, it probably depends who you're asking of these um, three um, authors. Um, but I would say we are all interested in changes that occur and not so much changes that you do. Okay. Um, so the invention of a new technology would be a, a contingent change that occurs. Um, and then you have the, and then in Spinoza it's very nice because uh, it's a little bit like the, the positive and negative emotions. 
first you're taken aback and then you're suffering under the change and then comes a moment of mastery and that is also uh, sort of intellectual engagement with the way how this change affects you and you sort of regain your capacity so out of the change that occurs to you, you, you then can generate um, change that you are the master of. Um, and that would be sort of the, the, the political message so it's against cultural pessimism. Yes, things happen and yes, some changes we don't like, but there is no, there's probably, there's no going back and there's not much chance of, of conservatism. Um, so you sort of have to master uh, uh, the change that would be sort of my also that would be my Aristotelian uh, sort of habitus hexis answer uh, to your question become the change that occurs to you So the, the research that, that we talk about a lot of money, so the ERC, now it becomes important, the difference between ERC versus ERC, uh, it, that, that's the, the highest amount of money that you can ask for in, in, in Germany. Um, and there comes the point uh, in this application where you have to prove relevance. And when we first applied, nothing much was going on in the world and everything, that, you know, everything seemed relevant that was interesting. Um, but especially when researching emotion, and we're talking about at least 20 years of research in emotion right now. Um, so no one needed more differentiations between inner states and, and other inner states. Um, they wanted to ask, well, you know, look at what's going on. Why aren't you as emotion researchers, why, are you not, why aren't you saying anything um, about um, the Arab Spring and things are like, also um, there were riots in London, there was a lot going on, it was really when, when the world became sort of crazy, when change uh, really reoccurred. Um, and, uh, and the emotion paradigm, the psychological individual paradigm, especially two things that would, emotion philosophy was talking about individuals a lot, that was also what Laura mentioned, um, and the other point was that um, they tried to put it in these classificatory single emotions that had names. These two things fell apart. And then we had no theoretical model uh, to, to say what we uh, wanted to talk about. And, um, and also we felt, we, we also we were reminded of uh, like our responsibility as researchers also. Um, what I haven't mentioned is one consequence that we discussed here in the concept paper about effective arrangement thinking is that you yourself are in an effective arrangement with the topic you research. And we make a plea for that as well. Um, and not to, not to hide it under, under a false idea of objectivity. We're not, you're not saying you know, become enthusiastic in, in a bad sense, um, but state why something matters for you. And emotions are, I think, is a way of talking about why something matters, because it affects also intellectually. Ready? <laughs> okay. Thank you. We need this. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for um, staying, and thank you, Laura, for organizing this seminar and for having me be part of it. It's been really nourishing and rich and dense, and there's a lot to think about, a lot of things resonating with me that are that I, I relate to a lot in my practice. Um, I've learned a lot, I've changed, I would say. Um, and, um, and I'm gonna try to change you all, is my goal. I'm gonna try to surprise you, maybe shock you all. And uh, that's my goal with some moving images. So I'm gonna be as brief as possible because I know it's been a super long day. And what I wanna do is just maybe 
give a little bit of context and then I will um, move forward with some examples of stuff and then we can discuss it and then we can have some drinks and food later, which would be great. So, um, as Pierre said, I do, I, my practice is based on um, my work as a researcher and a teacher at the Harvard Sensory Ethnography Lab, which is a place um, where we tried to explore the interstices between documentary cinema, contemporary art, and um, social sciences. And so what we were, we try to do there is to build a practice-based laboratory for bridging practice and theory um, across fields interdisciplinary-wise. And um, so that is uh, the basis for a lot of the work that, that my practice has evolved into as a filmmaker, as a researcher. So I'm just briefly gonna put this slide up here. Oh wow, very high. Was the other one up there too? Yeah. Oh, it's distorted, yeah, it's distorted. Okay, I think I can fix that. Uh, one moment. You always have to test these things in advance. Uh, let's see, definitely stretched, definitely stretched. Well, let's see what happens there. So in any case, the, um, for me, the relationship of the, well, we'll try this, see if it works. The relationship, this triad between the, a little better, between the, the, the filmmaker, the researcher, the subject, and the spectator are really important. And so one of my goals, I would say, as a, as a researcher, as a filmmaker, is to transmit the experience of the field work more so than to explain the experience of the field work. So I think that that's an important distinction for me. And oftentimes um, there's a lot of sensorial work and embodied practices and emotions that go along with that. That the goal in the filmmaking work is to try to transmit that. Um, when I say the subject, I'm also talking about um, all the mise-en-scene of the subject. So that could be the subject of the person who's in the film, but it's also the, the landscape, it's also the, um, the location, the sonic landscape, it's also the um, historical context. All of these elements are part of the subject for me. And they, they play equal role in the work. So I have a, just a quote from um, Edgar Morin, the um, filmmaker and uh, <coughs> sociologist who I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, from Chronicle of a Summer that he made with John Roosh, um, which he, he said this in 1962, which I find quite um, resonant in my practice uh, even today. So every scientific film must accept happily, I will add, poetry and art. And he says, we must reflect on the type of truth that we seek. Wherever human feelings are involved, wherever the individual is directly interested, Wherever there are inter-individual relationships of authority, subordination, camaraderie, love, hatred, that is to say all that concerns the emotional fabric of human existence. This is the great <coughs> terra incognita of sociological or ethnological cinema, of cinema truth. This is the promised land. This is in, in practice, not only discovering a truth, but also extracting a truth that is lurking or hiding are always beneath the surface of appearances. In the end, the great merit of seeking the truth is not to bring the truth, but to pose <coughs> the problem of truth. So for me, this is an important uh, um, problem of truth. <coughs> In addition to the technical problems and the aesthetic problems and grammatical problems of cinema. Um, so <coughs> I, I, I wrote in my, um, description, I was going to talk about implicit knowledge, and I think that for me, David McDougall, who's an anthropologist and, um, and, a, and a filmmaker, has made quite a few interesting films and has written a couple books, this one's Trans Transcultural Cinema, where he talks about film as less of a communicative, communicative act than a form of engagement with the world, 
one that implicates the subject specter and the filmmaker alike. So this is um, important to my practice. And then um, I think, Laura, you talked about body and brain and dualism earlier. And so Deleuze has come up several times today. And I feel that um, the time image, the, well, the movement image and time image series are important texts in my um, sort of global uh, theoretical armature to my practice. And um, Deleuze talks, talked about in the time image um, this notion of having a body or brain cinema, intellectual cinema um, versus a cinema of the body. And that there are some filmmakers who work with the intellectual side, some with the body side, and others with, with both, who compose with, with both. So that's my goal is to try to compose with both. Um, I'll skip, to, I'll skip that actually, I'm, I'm gonna go, these are key points I'll get back to. So I feel it's, uh, it's late and I'd like to get involved in uh, a little bit of um, moving image work. So we'll go back to some other things later. So I'm gonna show you a clip and rather than to give you contextualization of what this film is about exactly and the research practices and all these things, Let's look at an extract. It's about 10, 12 minutes from a 60 minute piece. And then I'll give you a little bit of information after that. So, I don't have glasses on. Oh yeah. So the, uh, so. So I'm just gonna lay out some key points here and then I'm gonna wrap it up. So for me, having open systems for meaning making is really important. Um, the transmission of experience over explanation, um, which is very contrary to tra traditional documentary practices, publicity, all of these things, which are, are well versed in manipulating emotions. And what I'm trying to do is to create contradictory messages in some sense for the spectator rather than a unified message which makes you go and buy a Coca-Cola or makes you have a certain feeling about uh, a social issue or something like that. I'd rather leave the complexity embedded in it. Um, of course, the sensorial aspect, um, engagement with all the senses, sight, hearing, touch, smell, taste, uh, time, laughter, temperature, gravity. Um, uh, of course, uh, yeah, the list goes on. Um, body and brain, you know, this idea of composing with the corporeal and the intellectual. Um, and there's another aspect of um, Deleuze's time image that I like a lot. He talks about five characteristics of the time image, which is a post-World War II sort of destabilization of what cinema was, what art was, and which I think is still ongoing and going through a set of transformations as well. This idea of the dispersive situation, the deliberately weak linkages between action, the ca causal linkages, um, the voyage form, the, the consciousness of cliché, so playing with cliché, and um, the renunciation of plot. So these are also things that I'm thinking about when I'm constructing my work. Uh, incongruities, polarity, abjection, um, surprise, disgust, um, getting people out of their comfort zone. I'm out of my comfort zone when I'm making these projects. I'm embracing a certain unknown factor. I'm going through the process of uh, you know, uh, having that real tangible lived experience and the fragility of that and meeting people that I ordinarily wouldn't and, and I'm trying to transmit that as well to the spectator as much as possible and to get you out of your comfort zone um, and allow these incongruities to, to coexist uh, these competing ideas, which also hasn't come up with Brecht and his um, distanti distanciation effect, Verfremdungsecke uh, effect. How, how do you say that in German? The Brecht's dis distanti alienation effect? Verfremdungsecke? Yeah. <laughs> Mystery, problem, problem solving, deduction, revelation, these are all part of this sort of puzzle basis of uh, art making and documentary filmmaking, but I think we're all 
um, when we were always piecing puzzles together and creating, creating spaces where there's gaps, I think is important also for the spectator that then transmits in some ways my experience of piecing the puzzle together as well. The importance of, uh, of the spectator is clear to me um, and empathy and this sort of empathic approach of trying not to reduce the other to something one dimensional but multi-dimensional, polyvalent, um, to, to not dominate the subject uh, with my own point of view but to, 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 to be open hearted, open minded but not to hide from the messiness of, uh, of life. Um, aesthetics, having an aesthetic strategy and a sort of dispositive and um, a, a rigor to, uh, to an aesthetic um, that is, uh, respects the spectator in a sense and respects a certain relationship to the mise-en-scene of the world and, um, and the sonic environment and the landscape and the space beyond the screen and all of these questions. Freud uh, calls it uh, this idea of aesthetics, the incentive bonus, which I, I think is a really um, interesting idea. Um, yields the pleasure, gives us a great release of pleasure and relaxation of the senses uh, in our minds. Um, and um, yeah, so I think it is 707. I think it's a good place to leave because you know, we did it really quickly, but it's been a long day, and so I will take questions, and uh, thank you. Consciously, but <laughs> you, now that you mention it, uh, I'm seeing a trend, so maybe I need to think about that more. I, I think that certainly, as a as a man, um, I don't know. There there are different ways of relating to to people and subjects, and I've always been able to connect with men in a, in a way that it opens them up easier. Um, I think I didn't show Line Fork and I didn't show uh, another project that I'm in the process of working on, which is about older men, so like in their 90s. So I'm also, I think, interested in aging and masculinity and the fragility of uh, us as humans, but particularly uh, aging men, particularly. So, yeah, it's an interesting question. sensorial for me is to try to, tr to try to create aesthetic strategies that enable you to have an experience that 
is more than just informational, is more than just discursive. And so using certain compositional techniques, using uh, camera movement perhaps, using um, you know, sound dimensions, things like that, those are strategies towards activating the sensorial. And so I would say privileging the sensorial as well, because it, rather than to say, I'm gonna give you the information, I'm gonna tell you a story, and you're gonna go along and stay along for the ride. I'm also, I think, in the montage, by creating these ruptures, by creating these fissures, these sort of incongruities, it forces you, even, but with an aesthetic, so that it, you, you, you realize that it's not bad or it's done you know, hastily, then you, you're, you as a spectator are, are forced to deal with that and say, this, this author is, knows what they're doing, yet they're creating these sort of counterpoints visually or counterpoints sonically to create these dimensions that are pushing me uh, sensorially. And, like, uh, and the more you can engage that, get the spectator op open to that too, because we tend to be spectators who just want you know, that YouTube three minute information bit and that's it, and I got my, my news or things like that. So it's trying to get people to sort of get out of that rhythm. And it's it's a it's Yeah, I wrote it down. It's a, it's it's a, it's a video. So they, um, you all know them, and you've, you've, heard, uh, you've seen videos of them, if you've never met them, and uh, they, they have a tendency to go on autopilot, and they just talk, and they deliver their, their points. And so that's kind of what happens once they get rolling. And, but there's the in-between times, there's the before and the after that's really interesting. And so the, the in, in this film, what I ended up doing, because I, mean, I, I don't have time to talk about all the details, but I ended up dropping the film for years, picking it back up later and looking at the odds and ends and the tails and heads and all the sort of detritus. And I said, actually, that's really interesting. And I need to reinvestigate, I need to look at the film completely again, all the footage, and I need to re reconsider what's the valuable material because I was, you know, I was younger, I was not mature enough as a, as a thinker, or as an artist to, to sort of deal with that material. And my, my ideas changed, so I, I had to re-look re at it all. Um, and I think it, 
Yes, that gesture is certainly to to give them a more human aspect, a more human uh, quality, but it's also to put them on the same level as all the other participants in the film. All the people from uh, the former Yugoslavia who were in the film, I didn't want to elevate Tomsky and, and Jen to this point of the experts that they know all and they're going to tell us information. I wanted to put them in it and I, I frankly, not to intentionally like undermine their ideas, but they get their, they get their moments, but I want to, you know, play, be playful with them a little bit as well. And this consciousness of the cliche of the intellectual uh, and the, the cliche of Noam Chomsky, he's a cliche, I'm sorry. And so I love that. Yeah, I really do. But so the, um, and the, the gesture to not put names was important too. And not only so that they didn't get identified particularly with, with, with name tags, but nobody gets identified with a name. And that also wipes away ethnicity. So you don't have, if you don't have the last name, Obviously, if you are from the region, you're going to be able to pick up details that are, that are much more nuanced. But if you're not from the region, you're not going to be able to, to tell, is that a Serb, is that an Albanian, is that a Croat? It's very hard to tell. So that was sort of the intention for that question. Can you describe your systematic challenge? First off, the part of the action uh, who uh, put the possibility and, and it is not uh, except uh, Chomsky with uh, smiling uh, that uh, can be uh, interpreted but uh, the other guys uh, that smile uh, well, first one uh, is uh, uh, displayed This guy seems pretty emotional to me. Yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah, this okay. one has uh, something to say. And okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, no, no, it's uh, mainly in the second. Uh, ah, in the second, second one. Movie. Okay. Second well, in the second one, there's the, the time where he's speaking. Well, there's two characters in this one. There's the younger one with tattoos, and there's the, uh, the older yeah. man. The older man is being interviewed. Yeah, the film is still in progress, so I think that um, 